Gemara tells of the fascinating adventures of a man named Rabba Bar Bar Khana. He says like this, in one of my adventures, I came across an Arab. The Gemara calls him a Saya. This Saya told me that I'll take you to the place where heaven and earth kiss. He says, such an offer I couldn't refuse. The place where heaven and earth meet? I followed this man and we journeyed for many, many, many days through fields and forests until finally on one evening we arrived at this place. He continues, I put down my bag to see this great phenomenon. I look back, my bag was gone. Rabbi Barbara Khanna continues, Ika gan vehacha, are there thieves here? It's the edge of the world, just me and the innocent Arab. He continues, the Arab calmed me down. He said, the cycle of the sun, it took your bag. Just wait 24 hours, my friends, and your bag will return. Before Pesach, I was invited to a public high school to speak to the students, and the subject was freedom. They figured, I'm a rabbi, Passover's coming, probably sounds like a good subject for a rabbi to speak about. Okay. I walk in, and I see this nice group of uh, 16 and 17 year olds, wonderful uh, young people, and I looked at them, and I said, I don't know why they invited me to speak about freedom. You guys know everything there is to know about freedom. Please, someone, tell me, tell me about being free. This silence. I said, please, somebody, can you tell me something important, something about being free? Finally, this young girl, she, get, she gets up and she says, I'll tell you about freedom. Freedom is if I can wear anything I want. I said, that's nice, that's freedom. But tell me, um, what is it that you want to wear? What's the, what's the matter, what's the difference, anything? Okay, and what's in your closet? Probably designer clothes. You think they just happen? They probably are made by some clothes designer in France. And the moment that clothes designer needs another penny, there goes your wardrobe. sits down. Then this boy gets up and he says, yeah, I'll tell you true freedom. Freedom is to watch TV all day. I'm going to watch TV. No one's going to tell me how much to watch, when to watch, how to watch. I'm going to watch TV all day. I said, that's nice. So you're just going to flip through the channels all day, one after another. There's probably a show that you like. So he says, so? I said, so what show is it? So he named some show. And I said, uh, and what time is the show on? So he said, ah, seven to eight. I said, so if I was a telemarketer, I'd know exactly what time to call your house. <laughs> You're predictable. You're going to be there in front of a TV every single night from 7 to 8. Are you free or are you a slave? So we went through a number of these motions until we came to the conclusion that freedom is a choice that we have to choose who it is we want to be controlled by. Whether it's a clothes designer in France, whether it's a television, or perhaps a Torah. That's our choice. A very interesting story happened a little under 4,000 years ago. These Jewish people were slaves in Egypt back-breaking labor. We say it every year in the Haggadah. We know how terrible it was. We eat it. Just to remember that hard, back-breaking labor, the slavery. 
And so comes along the great Savior God, and he takes the Jews out of bondage into freedom. And then 50 days later, takes them to a mountain, lifts the mountain, according to the Midrash, over their heads, and said, guess what? Now you're my slaves. What kind of joke is that? They're slaves. Now they're free. And then they're slaves again. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, a, there's a very famous book. I'm sure many of you, of you have heard of it. It's called the Tanya. And the Tanya's opening line, and it's interesting why the Alter Rebbe picked the opening line of the Tanya. It goes like this. It quotes, it quotes a, a Brisa, a Talmud. Mashabim also tihit tzaddik Rasha. Before a child comes into the world, an angel comes to the child and says, when you go down there to that world, I want you to be good and not bad. What? What an interesting opening line. What does that mean? And we understand that everything in our life, the Torah explains, is predestined besides one thing to be good or bad. And that's our choice. And every single day, we make those choices. Sometimes they're very small choices, and sometimes they're very big choices. When we're younger, some, somehow they're life-changing choices, and as we get older, they're less life-changing. So, let's say, just for argument's sake, that a person, after going through this battle for many years, decides, I am going to choose for the Torah to control me. Let's say, I don't know anyone who's done it, but if somebody has, good for them. What would be? Does anyone have any ideas? If somebody went through this choice, Decided. I mean, I don't know if anyone's actually logically gone through this whole process. Yes, no, maybe there's something else out there, maybe this religion, that religion, this thing, that thing. Decided, you know what? Judaism is for me. The Torah is for me. It's my choice. That's freedom. Is that freedom? For me, yes, sure. What's so free about it? I think it's very restricting. Peace. And how is it peace? Is, is, would there be a way of knowing that? So we believe in it first and then we know it, so to speak. Okay. Oh, of course. I, I, I agree with you. So it's a belief. But there, there's, there's no reason why they can't... I mean, the, the Torah exists, especially today. Walk in the chapters. There's a there's a nice section on the Torah. You know, today there's a lot of choices. We, people can choose that. It's very interesting. The Jewish people have gone through a very colorful history, but there's one particular aspect that, if you look through every single story. In Jewish history, it comes back to one fundamental. For example, in the beginning, Jacob knows that he's going down to Egypt. He was a holy man. He had some kind of divine intuition. He knew what was going to happen to the Jewish people. And so what did he do? He sent, he sent his son Yehuda ahead of him to build houses of study, to study Torah, because he knew that was the secret. Then the, before, before the exile of Zedekiah, of Sitkiyahu, there was the Jewish people, the leaders, were given three requests. The first was to keep the leadership of the family of Rabban Gamliel. The second one was they wanted a doctor who can heal Rav Tzadok, because Rav Tzadok had tremendous prayer, and he said that he prayed for the generation. And the third one was 
to keep the scholars learning because they knew that was the secret. And even 60, 70 years ago in communist Russia, in a, in a cellar, in a cellar, in a cellar, people were studying Torah because they knew that was the secret. And even today, we're all sitting here for one reason, because we know no matter what's happening in Israel, no matter what's happening to our, to our brothers and sisters there, we have one thing that we can do, and that is to sit and study. The whole world can say that doesn't make sense. Go learn judo and karate, go fight. Why sit and study? What does Torah do to the people in Israel or to our brothers and sisters all over the world that's going to change something that seems political or that seems Neutral. political? <laughs> Any ideas? Hope. Tell you a story. There was once, there was once a great. Yeah. There was once a great follower of the Baal Shem Tov. He was a very rich man. He lived in a big city on a big mountain. He had maids and servants, comfortable surroundings. But every so often, as he was going on his business trips, he would pass through the town where the Baal Shem Tov lived and he would, so to speak, recharge his spiritual battery. On one particular visit, the Baal Shem Tov said, on your way home, you're going to pass through a town. And in this town lives a friend of mine. His name is Bear. I want you to seek out his well-being on my behalf. Well, the student was so excited. My Rebbe gave me a personal mission, so he quickly told his driver, Get the horses ready, we gotta go at once. I have a personal mission. I don't have any time to waste. So he got the horses and they went as fast as they could. While he's in the wagon, he's thinking to himself, if it's a friend of my great Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tov, his name is not Bear. It's probably his name is the great Rabbi, Rabbi wonderful Bear. So he comes to the town and he starts asking around. Where is this great Rabbi Bear? Nobody ever heard of this guy. He goes from house to house, knocks on every door. No one had ever heard of this Rabbi Bear. He's broken hearted. He came all this way. It can't be. The Baal Shem Tov sent him on a personal mission. He must be here. And he went again through the whole town. But finally he realized he just wasn't there. He gets into the wagon and he tells his driver to go. As he comes to the outskirts of the city, he sees a little broken down shack. He says, it can't be possible. But you know what? I have to try it out. So he gets out of the wagon. And he goes and knocks on the door. A young man answers the door. How can I help you? I'm looking for the great Rabbi Bear. I didn't know of any great Rabbi Bear, but uh, my name is Bear. Your name is Bear. I come from the Baal Shem Tov. You come from the Baal Shem Tov. I'm so honored to have you in my home. Please, you must be a guest in my home. The, the wealthy man is invited into the home and he steps down. And you can see immediately the bare walls. The man's family was sleeping on some hay on the floor sits him down in a chair that can barely hold him up. And a few minutes later, he comes back with some food, but all it was was some lukewarm water with a chicken bone in it. But he tried to ignore his surroundings and think, but this is his mission, this is his place. And so the whole night, they sat talking about the Baal Shem Tov and the great wonders and miracles and the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. In the morning, he gave him some hay to sleep on, but he was tossing and turning, thinking about his comfortable bed at home. As dawn came, he took him to the outskirts of the city, as was customary. Before we departed, the wealthy man turned to this bear, and he said, 
I have one question to ask you. Please, ask. How can you live like that? Bear smiles, he says, why, how do you live? Me, I have a big house and a big mountain. I have comfortable surroundings. He said, if that's so, what you say, how could you stand one night in my home? Well, I'm on a business trip. And being on a business trip, I know that it's not gonna be as comfortable as it is at home, but I can afford one or two nights without the comfort that I'm accustomed to. Bear smiles and he says, me too. I'm also on a business trip. I'm on a business trip in this world and I can afford my time that it's not gonna be as comfortable. We have a tremendous responsibility. I know it sounds scary, but it's true. We have a responsibility. Our responsibility is to take this world and to elevate it and to make it a beautiful place. And some people can do that physically by picking up the trash off the floor. And some people can do that spiritually. But that's our responsibility. And the whole world comes, comes along the Arab. And he says, what are you doing? Let me show you the true life. Let me show you the true world. I'll take you to the place where heaven and earth kiss. Please, you don't need to go here. Let me take you to the mountains of Mongolia. There you'll find true spiritual enlightenment. I'll take you to the mountains of Japan. We'll study Kendo. That's spiritual. Perhaps you can become a monk. That's very spiritual. What are you doing? Why do you live here? What's the point? That's not spirituality. And so, an offer like that we can't refuse. And so we follow the Arab. And we take along that bag with us. The same bag that our parents and grandparents took with them through the camps. That same bag that our great-great-grandparents took with them to the pogroms. We carried that bag with us. The bag with the Shabbos candles. The bag with our only Torah, our copy of the Torah. We carried all the mitzvahs that we did. And we went and followed the Arab. And when we got there and we saw this incredible place, we threw it away. When we got to Ellis Island and we saw the Statue of Liberty, it all went away. And we enjoyed it for a few moments. And then we looked for it, but it was gone. And we tried to go back to it. And every time we tried a little bit, it was too, it was too far gone. It was too, it was lost. And so what do we do? What's the answer to the story? To love your fellow man. That's the answer to the story. Is that the answer to the story? That's the answer to the story. And to love your fellow man. When the Gentile came to Hillel and said, tell me the whole Torah on one foot, on one foot he said, do not to yourself, to others, what you don't want done to yourself. We have an obligation to take this world, not to run away, to take our bag, because we are midgets on the shoulders of giants. Because we don't only have what we learnt in our pockets, we have our grandfathers and our great-grandfathers and all the ancestors, all the way from Abraham, what they did is they gave us this whole package, this incredible amount of knowledge, this incredible amount of mitzvahs, and they have created what it means to be a Jew. 
And what we take is we take the, the giants, all these incredible things that they've done, because, we're, because we can take pride for that. All those wonderful things that our forefathers have done, we take pride in that. And we take that and we carry it with us. And then, once we hold that in our hands, what is there to be ashamed of? What is there, there to be fearful of? We have it all. I was once on a subway in Chicago. I was sitting there, minding my own business, reading a book, and I see there's just someone standing in front of me. So I look up, and he says, can I, can I sit down? I said, sure. He says to me, are you a rabbi? I said, I guess so. <laughs> For argument's sake, sure. He says, tell me, what would you tell a Jewish boy who was thinking about marrying a non-Jewish girl. Just like that, he says it. I say, what would I tell him? I'd tell him that he's killing himself. What? He, not only is he killing himself, he's killing all of his future generations and all of his previous generations. Gone. He shakes he's got shaken up a little bit. He says, what? He says, you understand I'm talking about myself. I said, so? Tell me. What do you think? He got very emotional. And we started talking. In the middle of the conversation, he asked me a question that I think struck a part of my soul. And it really, I'll, I'll ask the question to you. He says to me, what's the difference between you and me. I said, there's nothing. Is your mother Jewish? Yes. My mother's Jewish. We're the same. We're both Jews. We're both from Abraham. There's no difference. He said, Rabbi, don't give me that. Look at you. You got a beard. You got the hat. You do the right thing. We're not the same. We're very, very different. I said, no, no, no. What are you talking about? We're the same. He said, if we're really the same, why should I be religious? Any answers? Huh? Honor your father and your mother. To feel, to feel good. But, well, but if we're the same, if we're really the same, honor your father and mother. It's true, that's, that's, that's good. But that doesn't answer the question of why we're the same. And now that we follow the Torah, why not have it? It's also it's also a good answer. But if we're really the same, then what? And we're and I'm not really any any greater than him, which is true because we're all children of Avram and and, and Sarah. We're we're all the same. So why should we be religious? The freedom to choose. Okay, freedom to choose. I'll tell you the answer that I gave him, and please use it. Use this answer. The answer is like this. Imagine you have a gas stove. A gas stove. And on the gas stove, there are four burners. The first burner is very lit up. It's heating up everything. The second burner has a small flame slowly but surely getting the job done. The third burner, the pilot lit, but the flame never ignited. So there's these sparks that are flying out. And the fourth burner is the flame, is the pilot as it's igniting. There's that annoying ticking sound. I said, so too there are four Jews. The first Jew, big flame. Whoa, too Jewish. Stand back. The second Jew has a small flame. Torah, mitzvah, slowly but surely gets the job done. The third Jew has a spark. A Rosh Hashanah, a Yom Kippur, a Hanukkah bush, a Pesach Seder. And the fourth Jew 
has an annoying ticking sound. It has the same flame as the others. But that flame, that Jew's flame, is an annoying ticking sound. But subconsciously, the Jew tries to get rid of this ticking sound. Goes to some spiritual retreat in the Rocky Mountains, and another retreat, and, uh, and somewhere else, and tries this and tries that, not knowing that everything's in their own backyard. But I told him, the beauty of it all, the wonder of it all, is that we're just four burners on a gas stove. We're all part of the same gas stove. From the one that's too Jewish to the one that's still searching, we're all part of the same unit. And that's why we're here today. Because we're part of the same unit. We have made the choice to be free. To choose what it is we want to be controlled by. And being a free person, once you give God and say, this is your freedom. I'm choosing you as my freedom. And God says, sure, I'll take care of the rest. Don't worry. Once you plant the seed, once you make the vessel, the blessing comes. If you have a cup, it will be filled. And that's why we set a time for Torah study. Because by setting a time for Torah study, we fill, we say to God, okay, Here's my cup. Fill it up. And you can ask whatever you want. Because that's our choice. And God gave us that choice to be free. Any questions? If I have a Jewish mother, can I be a non-Jewish person? No. You can, you can tell that's somebody... That's fine. I never That's... went to a synagogue, I never prayed. So uh, why am I still a Jew then? It's your choice. Your choice was not to go to synagogue and not to pray. That Does... is my choice. That's good. So okay. that's, there's no problem with that. That's the choice that you've made. So, but you, you, you say that I can't have my choice. You have a choice. It doesn't but, mean... But, uh, but you say that I can, uh, that, I, that I am still a Jew. You are still a Jew. <laughs> but I am not. You've made a choice to choose. He just told me this is the first time in his whole life that he heard a rabbi. He just told me that. Well, the first great. time in wow. his life. I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> but he's... The, I understand, I understand what you're saying. I agree with you, and it's something that we can't, we, that we don't have time for, but hopefully we'll have time that we can sit one on one. Yes? I have a challenging question. Okay, I'll see if I have a challenging answer. Good question. The question is, if I had a choice, and I knew that it, it would ultimately be good, but I have to do something that's not good to make it good, would I, would I choose that? I think that, I, I give a lot of classes to young professionals, and, and what I've found over the past few years that I've been giving these classes is that people in our society, and it's totally not our fault, we don't 
understand, we don't have boundaries. We don't understand what is, what is good and what is bad. Everything is just one, like this big mishmash. Of, and it's because, obviously after, you can blame it on the 60s, I don't know what, you can blame it on anything. But today, there's no morals. And it's very obvious in the world. And I think that's why some, so to speak, religion has become so popular because people are, are, are looking for something, for something to kind of say, okay, this is, there's gotta be a boundary, there's gotta be a moral, it can't be the way it is. So I think that if it came to a circumstance, now every circumstance is different, but I think that really there's no such thing as something that's bad. There's the good and there's the potential good. And it's perhaps to the, to the naked eye, it may seem that it's not good today, but really it is inherently good. Now, as far as it specifically answer the question, every case has to be taken in itself. Um, it's not something you can, I, if you have to make a split second decision, I don't know what, I, I don't know what, what would be. Anything else? And so just to conclude, Rabbi Barbar Khanna represents us, each individual, and we all have our journeys and we need those journeys because those journeys make us who we are as individuals. Now, when we take our bag and we use our experiences and we use our ancestors and we create our life and what it is, then what we're doing is making this world a place for God. And how do we do that? By doing exactly what we're doing, by sitting here today.